Welcome to Conversations on the Coast. We are going to be talking today to Raymond Bonner, who's got a lot of credits to his name. He's a lawyer as well as an author, a Pulitzer Prize winner, all that kind of good stuff. And he is an expert, I think, after reading this book on the death penalty and how it works in this country of ours. The book, again, Anatomy of Injustice, A Murder Case Gone Wrong. Raymond Bonner is with us. Thank you for stopping by. Well, thank you, Jim, for having me. And lest I forget, published by Alfred A. Knopf, which is our favorite publisher here because we like that cadence of Alfred A. Knopf. Well, I've done all, three of my four books with them, so I'm very, it's, I'm very fortunate. You're, you're a good man. <laughs> you're a good man. The uh, uh, purpose of, uh, of the book... It was actually changed, you say, in, in in the epilogue, I think, is where, is where I read this, that you were going to have a book with a somewhat narrower focus. It was uh, going to uh, really look uh, closely, which I think it still does, on one of the characters in it. And uh, your agent said, no, you should work more broadly. You should get into the whole morass, I think, of, it, of uh, the death penalty, and so you do. For example, when you're telling uh, your your main story about Mr. Elmer, uh, you also bring in other cases that are going through the appeal system all the way up to the uh, Supreme Court so that when one is through reading the book, it's like I'm taking a bath in this whole business. <laughs> sometimes I want to thank you for that, and sometimes I don't. So why did you decide to go so broad? Well, interesting way you say it, like taking a bath, and it reminded me, and I think I have it a line in the book, is, and while I was writing it, I used to think this is, I'm writing this part for Hollywood and part for Stanford Law School, which is, <laughs> which is where I went, because there's a lot of, a lot of it is about the law, uh, judicial system in America, but then, of course, there's a very compelling case of the, the defendant, Edward Lee Elmore, and the lawyer, Diana Holt. So it, it is part Hollywood and, and part for, for law school. I went more broadly because I had an extremely good editor, uh, Jonathan Siegel at Knopf, who really pushed me. He said, the story about Diana Holt and Edward Lee Elmore is compelling, but you need to make it broader. And he would write in the margin, Jim, I and mean, you've interviewed a lot of authors, so you'll appreciate this. He would write in the margin, what's the role of the defense counsel? What's the role of the prosecutor? What's <laughs> And, you know, my first reaction was, Everybody knows that, don't they? And then I started looking back and I realized I didn't know it, which meant I was either on the golf course or skiing when I should have been at class at Stanford <laughs> or I'd forgotten what I'd been taught. And I went back and I did a lot of reading into those things and was fascinated particularly about the role of the prosecution. Yeah. I mean, the prosecution's role, contrary to what most people think, is not to get a conviction. The role of the prosecutor is to do justice. Which and is in, very, very different. Yeah, very different. And and the obligation of the prosecutor and the obligation of the defense are very, very different. The rules are different. The ABA, American Bar Association, standards of ethics are different for, for each side. What's the basic essential role then of the defense? To gain an acquittal for your, for your, for your client. And you, it is not the role of the defense counsel to ask... Is my client guilty or not? Your obligation is to defend him to the best of your ability. And in this case, the, the, the defense counsels were lousy, as we know they are in so many of capital cases. Yes. You know, we've had sleeping lawyers. We've had drunken lawyers. We have the famous Fifth Circuit opinion saying, well, just because you're entitled to a lawyer doesn't mean you're entitled to an incompetent or an effective <laughs> lawyer. Uh, and in Elmore's case, and then that's why I call it an anatomy of injustice, because you had... His lawyers, one was called the drunken cowboy, and the other referred to his client as the red-headed nigger. Uh. And that was his trial lawyers. On appeal, he had very good lawyers. But then if you look at the other side, the prosecution was equally irresponsible, more so because the prosecution's obligation is to do justice, not necessarily to gain a conviction. The whole business of uh, capital punishment was at one time in your journalist life, it was your beat. It you, was. You traveled the country, and, and that's where the uh, 
where the uh, prize came from. The, the the I started this book actually. I came across the story, the Elmore story, in two thousand. Uh, when during Meet the Press, it was almost 12 years ago this month, Governor George Bush was on Meet the Press, and it was right after Governor Ryan had declared a moratorium on the death penalty in, or on executions in Illinois, and Tim Russert on Meet the Press asked Bush, will you do the same in Texas? Which, is, of course, executes more people than almost all other states combined. And Bush said, no, because I am convinced that no innocent person has been executed in Texas, yeah. And then he went even further and said, and they've all had a fair trial. Oh. Smart man. So that, you know, that sent, I was working at the New York Times, a reporter in the Washington Bureau, and I said to an editor, that reminds me of throwing down of the gauntlet, a la Gary Hart, remember in the Democratic primary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where Gary Hart said, basically, catch me if you can. And I said to an editor, this is a throwing down of the gauntlet, only it's far more serious. And the Times, New York Times, sent me to Texas to write, start writing about the death penalty. And, and you kept at it for how, how many years? Well, I've been at this book for 12 years. Huh? Okay. It's a labor of outrage, not a labor of love. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, after 11 years on death row, uh, Elmer gets a, a really big break. The break is called Diana Holt. Who's she? Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Today we're talking to Raymond Bonner, author, lawyer, all around world traveler, lives in Scotland. And all those kind of nice things. Written a book published by Alfred A. Knopf. The title is Anatomy of Injustice, A Murder Case Gone Wrong. Linda Greenhouse, the author of uh, Becoming Justice Blackman, says in part, Raymond Bonner uses his skills as a lawyer and a journalist to take us on a fascinating journey deep into the heart of the criminal justice system where the stakes could not be higher or the failures more disturbing. Anatomy of Injustice reads like a novel, but it is, tragically, all too true. And that is tragic, that it is as true as it is. Um, now, at, 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 at the heart of this uh, case is the man accused of, of murder. He's Edward Lee Elmore, and his story runs the gamut uh, with regards to this debate about capital punishment, race is involved, prosecutorial misconduct, mental <laughs> retardation, bad, which is hardly the right word, trial lawyers, they're terrible, ugly f folks, supposedly lost evidence somewhere in the scheme of appeals. Uh, the prosecution suddenly discovers an incredible amount of evidence that never came forward before. How can that happen? Well, the prosecution, it's not that it never came forward. It's worse. The prosecution actually, the state actually hid the evidence. At Elmore's trial, the prosecutor said that during the autopsy, a negroid hair had been found on the victim's abdomen. And Diana Holt impishly refers to it as the DNA, the dead naked abdomen. <laughs> and... This 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 Negroid hair, which was item T, and in the book, so I have the chapter, the search for item T, was never introduced into evidence, was never turned over to the defense, as the prosecutor is obligated to do. Under our law, prosecutors are entitled, required to turn all potentially exonerating evidence over to the defense. Item T then went missing, disappeared. And Diana Holt, through her doggedness, 16 years later, found it. And guess where it was found? In the same police officer's file cabinet who had examined it 16 years earlier. And guess what? It was looked at again. It wasn't a Negroid hair. It was a white person's hair. And it wasn't the victim's, which suggests, and Elmore is black, suggests that another person murdered Mrs. Edwards. One of the main reasons that this case has been kept alive and grinds and grinds and grinds is this woman, 
this incredible woman, Diana Holt. What do you think of her? Incredible is the absolute word. She is, I call her in the book, sui generis. I have never met anyone like her. I remember the first time I met her, and we were walking down the street in Columbia, South Carolina, and it was raining, and she takes off her sandals and shoes and walks along, and then she reaches into her purse, and she pulls out her Nokia, and she punches in some numbers, and the next thing, she's got Elmore on the phone from Death Row, and she's saying, hi, Pokey Wokey, (laughs) and he says, obviously, how are you, and she says, I'm just peachy. And then she says something like, oh, you want your, you're getting your head buffed so you can get out of there on Friday night? Uh, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, lawyers don't talk like this. I'm a lawyer. And, but she is a lawyer, and this was her client. But Diana Holt's story, I mean, one of the reasons I wrote this book was because her story is so incredible. When she was 27 years old, she was on her second husband, one who had tried to kill her, had two children no high school diploma, and was so badly sexually abused when she was growing up, sexually abused by her stepfather, that I couldn't begin to talk about it on this program. You can read about it in the book Anatomy of Injustice, but I'm not going to talk about it on the air. And, Jim, she had something else in her background about which she told nobody, not even her adult boys, until shortly before the book came out. I mean, she cooperated with the book and helped and told me her story and allowed me to publish it, but she hadn't told them. When she was 17 years old, she had run away from Houston to New Orleans and with some guys she'd met in a bar the night before. They ran out of money. They hatched this plot where she went to a bar, flirted with a guy. They went out to this guy's car. Her new friends run up and stick a gun in his temple. He reaches under his seat to get his gun. He's a U.S. Marshal. Oh, goodness. She go, she, nobody gets killed. Nobody gets hurt. She gets caught, goes to prison for three years. She then comes out, and that's when she has these domestic situations, the husband who tries to kill her. The state won't prosecute because they say it's your word against his. She decides she's going to become a lawyer at 27 and goes to junior college, junior co- straight A's, straight A's, straight A's, and gets into the University of Texas Law School. And then goes to South Carolina and is given the Elmore case and doggedly, doggedly, doggedly pursues it. She's given the Elmore case because this is the kind of thing as a lawyer that she wants to do. And I don't know why. Is it because of where she's come from, knowing pain, knowing difficulty, you know, knowing knowing tough things? I mean— the way you describe her, she seems absolutely brilliant and capable of putting on the right clothes and, you know, having a fantastically successful big income career. That's that's not Diana Holt. Big income career isn't what she wants. I mean, she is incredibly talented, uh, obviously quite smart, but she's very she's very committed. I mean, she has empathy with these death row clients. I've heard her talk to many of them. It's not just sympathy and it's not she, it's not an intellectual pursuit for her. It oh. is a personal thing. Wow. Now, this in this case and in many, many other cases, these, these appeals and stuff go on and on and on for many, many years. Who pays for that? State. All the time? Usually. Uh-huh. But, you, you know, the conservatives criticize that often. Oh, we've got to do something about that. They go on and on endlessly. Well, thank God they do. Because as we see in this case, if the appeals hadn't gone on and on endlessly, we the man would have been would have been executed. I mean, l- nobody criticizes in the civilian litigation if an appeal goes on endlessly to save Enron right. thirty million dollars. Why should there be criticism of defense lawyers who continue appeals? This is a long story that's told in this book, but I'm here to tell you, the story is still going on, and when we come back. You'll find out where it's at now. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Anatomy of Injustice, a murder case gone wrong. That's the title we're talking about this week, the author lawyer 
as well as an author, Raymond Bonner, win, winner of a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, his book is published by our friends at Alfred A. Knopf. Uh, Tony Horowitz, who wrote a, a number of books, including uh, uh, Confederates in the Attic, uh, talks about this book in rather glowing terms. He says, in part, race, sex, and murder in a southern town are the explosive core of Raymond Bonner's legal drama. Anatomy of Injustice is also a brave dispatch from the trenches of a forgotten war over capital punishment. I guess it is forgotten, huh? It goes up and down. Up and down. You know, okay. I think at the moment, several states are moving to eliminate capital punishment, as is mm-hmm. California. It's possibly going to be on the ballot. To yes, here. yes. Told with a reporter's tenacity, a lawyer's acumen, and an advocate's zeal. It's all those things. The book is both a gripping narrative and a chilling indictment of America's justice system. So I thank your agent and your editor who said, you know, chew off a big piece this time, Ray, and let's see what happens. And what what's happened is uh, a very, very uh, nice piece of work. Well, thank you. Now, uh, a hell of a lot of hours and effort and struggle and thought have gone into this gentleman's case. And uh, one would think uh, that by this time it would be over, but it isn't. It, there is a piece. Uh, the book was reviewed uh, last Sunday in the San Francisco uh, Chronicle book section. And uh, if I can find it, I'll read what it said in the last paragraph. But I don't think I'm going to find it. Essentially what it said is that uh, – here it is. Earlier this month, they write, Elmore walked out of prison released after his advocates reached a plea arrangement with prosecutors. The prosecutors apparently are not willing to exonerate Elmore to say he is factually innocent of the murder. But at least Elmore's advocates can continue to seek exoneration with their client able to experience a modicum of freedom. That brings up the distinction that you make in the book, the distinction between being found innocent and exonerated. Talk about that. Well, exoneration can take many forms. If, if the DNA evidence comes back that you didn't commit the crime or if you didn't get a fair trial, let's say there was a constitutional violation, bad lawyers or improperly keep people off the jury or whatever, you might be released from death row and sometimes referred to as legally innocent, but factually, actually innocent, having no connection to the crime whatsoever, is not that common. Mm. And in this case, Edward Lee Elmore is factually, actually innocent. And as makes very, very clear in the book, the state planted evidence, manufactured evidence, hid evidence, and lied in order to gain a conviction. But he is he, he did not commit the murder of Mrs. Dorothy Edwards. He pleaded guilty, as you've just indicated, earlier this month, uh, in order to get out of prison. Mm. But as I said at the time, none dare call it justice because he'd been in prison for 11,000 days, 30 years. He's 53 years old, which means that more than half his life he was in prison, more than half his life he was on death row for a crime he did not commit. I mean, it's a, the ending as well as the beginning is anatomy of injustice because to get out of jail now, to get out of prison, mm-hmm. he had to plead guilty to a crime he did not commit. Amazing. Yeah. Tragic. Amazing. Injustice. Oh, good Lord. Are there any other heroes in here that you'd like to mention besides uh, our, besides yeah, our I mean, friend Diana? The lawyer. There's several lawyers along the way who, who, who really devoted themselves to it. Chris Jensen, a New York lawyer, a civil, lit- civil litigator, you know, like many civil litigators decided there was more to do with their life than help rich people get richer and divide up rich people's money, <laughs> uh, took the case pro bono and represented Elmore. And I saw Chris Jensen in action. He represented Elmore as if he was representing com- some client paying 1000 or $1,500 an hour. He really poured himself into it. And his cross-examination in a subsequent hearing in the case 
it, again, it's just the stuff of law school and television. It was just brilliant, and he exposed lies by the state agents. I mean, for example, the state claimed they found 53 of Elmore's pubic hairs yeah, on yeah. the victim's bed. Well, first of all, Jim, if they did, it's a Guinness Book of Records because <laughs> the most you ever find in a crime scene, a rape scene, is about 8 or 10. And then it turns out, under the work of Chris Jensen and Diane Holt, Diana Holt, they never took any pictures of the bed, the police. They took pictures of the bed in the guest bedroom where nothing happened, but no pictures of the bed where they supposedly found 53 pubic hairs. No, no, no. There was a picture of the bed, but from long distance, <laughs> right. you could see the corner of it, right? <laughs> right. With, with, with the police camera gear on it. Yeah. On this valuable pe- piece of evidentiary real estate, they put their cameras. Nor did they take the sheets as evidence because they... I mean, it's preposterous. And Chris Jensen's work exposed exposed this. So, and John Bloom, there were several lawyers who really, but people ask me, is there a police officer or is there somebody like that? No, there was one judge who ultimately ruled in Elmore's favor uh, that he was mentally retarded. And then the Fourth Circuit, as the book ends, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ordered the new trial for Elmore, and that was quite a staggering ruling. And the Fourth Circuit used language like deceit and dishonest to talk about the police handling of this case. That's pretty strong language. It sure is, but it's deserved. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely deserved. My goodness. Uh, there will only be justice in this case, one last word if I may, if there's a federal investigation and these police officers are required to testify under oath. Only then can you say that there's justice because they put a man in jail, prison for 30 years for a crime he did not commit. Yes, and they're protected by the club. Exactly. They're protected by the rules of silence. But the Justice Department could investigate. Well, you can investigate this book very simply. Go get it. Read it. You'll be moved. You will be fascinated. And you will be challenged. Anatomy of Injustice, A Murder Case Gone Wrong by Raymond Bonner. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com.